target thing. I need any unit, any unit, you're on. You're on the fighting now. It's just a fight. Blow, blow up. It's just blow up. I need all five units to the sugary fighting now. It's a full guy. It's blow up. At 7.15 p.m. on February 7th, 2008, a violent explosion erupted at the Imperial Sugar Refinery in Port Wentworth, Georgia, just outside Savannah. Surveillance cameras in the area captured the blast, which took the lives of 14 workers and injured 38 others. The Chemical Safety Board launched an investigation. The fuel for the blast? Combustible dust. Combustible dust can be a catastrophic hazard in American industry. Three of the four most serious accidents that we've investigated have been combustible dust explosions. In 2006, this pattern of accidents spurred the CSB to issue a comprehensive study of combustible dust, which uncovered 281 fires and explosions that had occurred over the previous 25 years. The study revealed what the CSB called a significant industrial safety problem. Combustible dust fires and explosions continue to occur frequently, fueled by accumulations of combustible dust, which can gather over years in hidden places or in plain sight. No company wants to see its facility blown up and destroyed and its employees killed but they just don't understand what the hazard is. They don't realize that they have a hazard here until that one day when they, the, the explosion occurs and it's a terrible tragedy for them. And they look back and say, if we'd only known. When Tammy Miser got a phone call late one evening in 2003, she worried it would be about her brother, Sean Boone, who worked at an automotive parts factory. And we usually didn't answer the phone that way, but we knew when it kept ringing that there was something wrong, so we answered it, and um, there had been an accident there before, so I knew. I knew if they were calling me, it was my brother. Sean Boone was a mechanic at the Hayes Lemmers plant in Huntington, Indiana. I got you going around the corner, man. The company produced aluminum car wheels. The process of finishing the wheels left behind aluminum scraps, which were chopped into small pieces and sent to a furnace to be melted and reused. Chopping, drying, and blowing the dry chips through the transfer piping created highly combustible aluminum dust, which flowed through ducting to a steel drop box outside the building, where large particles were trapped. The air then entered a dust collector which removed finer aluminum particles. Over time, aluminum dust accumulated inside ducts. In addition, there were leaks in the piping used to transfer aluminum chips, which caused dust to build up on surfaces throughout the furnace area. Aluminum dust landed on beams, ledges, and equipment. In some places, the dust was several inches deep. On the night of October 29th, about 10 minutes after workers started the aluminum chip melting process, aluminum dust inside the dust collector was suddenly ignited, perhaps by a metal ember or impact spark, resulting in a large explosion. The blast propagated back through the duct into the steel drop box, blowing it apart. The fireball and pressure wave continued back through the duct system into the building gaining intensity as the accumulated aluminum dust ignited. The violent disturbance shook loose dust that had built up on external surfaces. At about 8.30 p.m., plant mechanic Sean Boone was one of several workers in the area of the furnace. Without warning, a fireball erupted from the furnace, engulfing the area and igniting airborne dust in a second, larger explosion. The explosion blew a 50-foot-wide hole through the roof of the building. Co-workers found Sean Boone lying on the floor near the furnace, gravely injured. He was rushed to the hospital and put on life support. And they told us that um, his internal organs were burnt, and they could take his arms, and they could take his legs, 
but he probably wouldn't make it and it would just prolong it. So we went ahead and took him off. Sean Boone was one of 14 dust explosion fatalities in 2003 alone. Launching a comprehensive investigation into the hazard, the CSB held two public meetings, convening panels of experts and listening to extensive public comment. First, combustible dust is a real serious problem in all of general industry. The CSB Second, report concluded that good engineering and safety practices to prevent dust explosions have existed for decades, but there is no comprehensive federal standard requiring adherence to those practices. And many companies are not taking effective actions to control dust hazards. As a result, the board recommended increased regulation of dust hazards. The final report was approved at a public meeting in Washington in November 2006. And the report and recommendations are adopted. We found in our study that the issue of combustible dust explosions is not focused on one particular industry. It happens right across all industries and industries that where you perhaps wouldn't expect there to be an explosion. Industries at risk include food production, metal processing, wood products, chemical manufacturing, rubber and plastics, and coal-fired power plants. The CSB study provides many examples of the continuing toll from dust explosions. Coal dust exploded in 1999 at the Ford River Rouge plant near Dearborn, Michigan. Six workers died and 36 were injured. Resin dust exploded at the Yon Foundry in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1999, killing three workers and injuring nine others. Rubber dust exploded at Rouse Polymerics in Vicksburg, Mississippi in 2002, leaving five dead. A nylon fiber explosion destroyed Malden Mills in Methuen, Massachusetts in 1995. In fact, between 1980 and 2005, the CSB found at least 281 combustible dust fires and explosions that caused 119 deaths, 718 injuries, and major damage to industrial facilities. NFPA supports... Amy Beasley Spencer is a combustible dust expert at the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. Beyond the loss of life and the injuries, when you think about the economic impact of a dust explosion, you hear about plants being completely destroyed. There's loss of jobs. It's an economic impact on the entire community. The CSB report called on OSHA to establish a comprehensive regulatory standard designed to prevent dust explosions in general industry. The board said OSHA should base the new regulation on the current standards of the NFPA. These codes address hazard assessment, engineering controls, housekeeping, building design, explosion protection, operating procedures, and worker training. The NFPA codes and standards have been in existence since the early 1920s, and there are seven codes and standards that deal directly with dust. It's a tragedy to have even one loss of life because the technology is out there to prevent these dust explosions. In addition to the NFPA, the Center for Chemical Process Safety, as well as a leading insurance company, have developed recommended practices on controlling combustible dust. The board also called for improved training of OSHA inspectors to recognize dust hazards. Interim CSB Executive William Wright explained the recommendation before the House Committee on Education and Labor in March 2008, citing three dust explosions the CSB had investigated in 2003. State OSHA officers had inspected all three facilities prior to the accidents, but the dust hazards were never recognized or cited. Furthermore, the CSB determined that all three explosions could likely have been prevented if the facilities had implemented NFPA recommended practices. In addition, the board recommended that OSHA revise its hazard communication standard to ensure that material safety data sheets better communicate dust hazards to workers. In response to the CSB's recommendations, in 2007, OSHA increased the enforcement of existing regulations through a new national emphasis program on combustible dust. Without a comprehensive standard for combustible dust, it's difficult for businesses to know which specific NFPA provisions 
or other requirements they may be subjected to. The explosions tragically continue. The list includes the blast that crippled the Imperial Sugar Refinery outside Savannah, Georgia in February 2008. Since 2005, about 70 additional dust explosions have been reported. And in fact, the Imperial accident last month is the deadliest industrial dust explosion in the United States since 1980. CSB Chairman John Breslin. I toured the facility about six weeks after the explosion. The damage that was done there was catastrophic. As you walk around the facility, you think of the people who were working there that day, who were killed and severely injured. It was a difficult experience to walk around that facility. It was a very sobering experience. What is so frustrating about dust explosions is that they're so preventable. And I believe that one of the reasons that dust explosions continue to occur may simply be a lack of understanding about the materials. Most solid organic materials will explode if the particles are small enough and they're dispersed in a sufficient concentration. Some of the materials that could form combustible dust, and there are lots of them, could include coal, sawdust, food products like sugar and flour, pharmaceuticals, many chemicals, and even many metals. Like all fires, a dust fire requires fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source. A dust explosion requires two additional elements, dispersion and confinement. The CSB commissioned laboratory tests using a sample of fine polyethylene dust found by investigators in the rubble of a North Carolina factory. Dust is dispersed into a flame, creating a fireball. When the dust is confined within a structure or a piece of equipment, a powerful explosion can occur and propagate, as this coal industry video demonstrates. Dust may accumulate on surfaces and lie undisturbed for years. Then some initial fire or explosion, known as a primary event, shakes it loose and ignites it. It causes a pressure wave to go through the plant, and that dislodges all of the dust that is perhaps unknown up on the rafters, on the beams, on the tops of equipment, and that serves as the fuel for the secondary explosions that move through the plant. Most of the fatalities and the devastating injuries have been caused by these secondary dust explosions. According to the NFPA, a catastrophic explosion can occur from as little as one thirty-second of an inch of accumulated dust around the thickness of a dime, covering just 5% of a room's surface area. The NFPA therefore recommends that companies control fugitive dust emissions, design facilities to prevent dust from migrating and accumulating, and perform rigorous housekeeping to remove any dust that does build up. The NFPA codes have been adopted either at the state level or in some cases at the local level, at the city level. But the problem is they're not enforced in any regular way. A catastrophic dust explosion at the West Pharmaceutical Plant in Kinston, North Carolina in 2003 reveals what can happen when companies do not properly assess the hazards from combustible powders and do not design their buildings and equipment appropriately. West Pharmaceutical made small rubber medical products, such as syringe plungers and stoppers, at a large manufacturing facility with nearly 300 workers. In the process, large batches of rubber were compounded and rolled into long strips. To keep these strips from sticking together, they were dipped in a vat containing a whitish slurry of water and finely powdered polyethylene, a petroleum-based wax-like plastic. The coated rubber strips were then blown dry with fans and folded for later processing. As the rubber sheets dried, combustible polyethylene dust, which was not visible to workers but is colored white here for illustration, was blown into the air. Over the years, the air conditioning system drew polyethylene dust into the hidden space above an acoustic tile ceiling that was suspended over the production area. 
There, the dust gradually built up to a thickness of up to one half inch on ceiling tiles, beams, conduits, and light fixtures, just a few feet over the heads of unsuspecting workers. January 29th began as a routine workday at the West Plant, but at about 1.28 p.m., a small fire or explosion occurred somewhere near the production area. It lofted the accumulated dust above the ceiling into a thick cloud, which then ignited in a much more violent secondary explosion. Some employees described a sound like rolling thunder as the dust explosion spread throughout the space above the ceiling and ripped through the building. The accident at West Pharmaceutical Services took the lives of six employees and injured 38 others, including two firefighters. The thing that set up the tragedy at West was the mere accumulation of hazardous dust above a ceiling. The NFPA code says that any openings where a dust could accumulate must be sealed. The solution would have been to either seal it or to not have a suspension.